Okay, so one one announcement uh, that uh, uh, we're really lucky. So we, we sort of got a fifth TA uh, at the last second, even though there was only kind of four official recitation classrooms. And uh, I asked the TAs uh, what to do. We had two options. Either uh, we can use the fifth person as a substitute and give people a break, or we could have an extra virtual one. And, and they quickly uh, suggested doing the extra PSO session. So, well, maybe this doesn't apply to you guys so much since you're obviously here, but especially for the people who uh, can't be in the classroom today, we have a Zoom session as well. Uh, one of the TAs will, will try his best using an iPad. I don't know if it'll be the same experience, but I think it's better than nothing. So it's the same URL that we're using for office hours. Hopefully that works. I tried to add them as host. Uh, and I said that uh, we'd have time to take uh, general questions and I'll, I'll keep asking for the next few classes until it's clear we're bored. Um, is there any questions I can take or otherwise I can keep uh, addressing Piazza? I know I'm a little bit behind on Piazza. Okay, sounds good. All right, so today is going to be sort of, a, I think, a funky lecture, uh, in my opinion, a little out of order compared to normal. Um, uh, but I think, uh, I think it's very interesting. And I think it's going to make sense, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. So this is about Boolean satisfiability problems. Okay, it's going to be a little bit more conceptual than last time. All right. Okay, so uh, by now you guys have been in CS for a while, so certainly you've been exposed to Boolean logic. At some level, computers can only do Boolean logic, but they can do a lot of Boolean logic really, really fast. Right, so uh, I'm assuming you've seen this notation before. But you know, we have variables x and y and z and whatever, and they take the values true or false, or uh, in computer speak, one or zero, right? Often true is represented by one, false is represented by zero, okay? And uh, so x and y, so true and true makes true, true and false makes false, as you guys have probably seen before is sometimes expressed with this wedge. Yeah. Or maybe in, in uh, some languages, it's an ampersand. Okay. So that's how we represent x and y. I'm sure that's not so new. x or y, so true or false makes true. False or false makes false. That's expressed with this v shape and then not x flipping the bit true becomes false false becomes true that's sometimes written uh oh as not x like that or more commonly or at least i often just put a bar above it to denote the opposite of whatever it was okay all right so uh doubtlessly you've seen this before so let's give a, an example. Suppose I wanted to implement the exclusive or function as a function of two Boolean variables. So f of x1, x2 should return true only if exactly one of the two values are set to true. Yeah. Does anyone want to uh, propose a formula for xor? You're also allowed to use parentheses and stuff. And it's definitely easier to do on paper than in your head, but. Sure, in the back.
Okay, so I'm uh, x1 or x2, and then is there a parentheses here? Okay, and not. Okay. X1 and X2. Okay, so I think that's correct, and I think I understand your logic, right? We need to know that at least one bit is set to true or false, right? So, okay, so we have two clauses that we have. Okay, let me, uh, let me draw this out as a tree then. Okay, so all Boolean formulas, we can also think of the nested parentheses sort of as a hierarchical thing. So there's some corresponding tree representation. So for this formula, what do we have? Okay, so there's an and here and an or of x1 and x2. And I guess we have a and, and I'll, I'll just put a not here. Okay, cheating a little bit. x1 and x2. So uh, just to parse this formula, since it's our first example, you know, this and says that I need both subtrees to value it to be true to output one, right? So let's break down each of the subtrees. The first subtree is saying at least one of the bits has to set, be set to be true, right? Either x1 or x2 has to be true or there's no way we should be able to output true. Okay. On the other hand, it's exclusive or. It's not just or. The, the left hand side is, is, is or. So to do exclusive or, we want to make sure that if they're both set to one, we actually flip it back to zero. So that's what the right hand side is sort of doing. Okay, this will be true. This will be true if both of them are set to be true. That's bad. So we flipped the bit. Okay. So this sort of implements the or part. That implements the exclusive part. Right? I guess that's what you had in mind. Excellent. Okay, so that's that's a nice clean simple thing. Okay. Here's a more complicated example. Uh, adding two bits, that seems like a basic thing to try to do. So this is going to be a formula of four bits, x1, x2, x3, x4. I'm only going to output one if x1 plus x2 is equal to x3, x4, sort of in binary. Okay, so this will be sort of like the most significant bit. And this will be the least significant. So this one at least took me more effort. I don't know if this is the shortest way to do it. But um, yeah, here would be one formula to implement it. I'll explain in a second how I at least came up with it. Okay. So in a tree, it'll look like this. There's no reason why you should stare at it and be like, oh yeah, obviously that works. But if you're careful, I think it's correct. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, so Boolean formulas. Now, now, one idea we're going to explore in this lecture is, okay, Boolean formulas seem really cut and dry. And actually, they also seem like something that computers will be really good at working with because they have like a very digital quality to them, right? They're kind of expressed as strings or they're represented by trees. Is exactly what computers are great at working with. Okay. There's something kind of uh, mechanical about Boolean processes, or not processes, uh, formulas. But we're also going to express the idea that Boolean formulas can describe a lot of things. Obviously, it's sort of a pain just to verify adding up two bits. I had, it took me like five minutes to write out the formula. Uh, but if you're creative, you can start doing more and more things with it. Okay, and how far does that logic go and what are the implications is sort of what today's lecture is about. Okay. So, 
take, take the following perspective where I kind of want to think of it as a programming language, right? Because programming languages are useful. We can do things when we program. Okay. So, okay, so here are our three primitives. I can do an and and an or, and I can flip a bit. But suppose I wanted to sort of encode something like z equals x. I have two variables. And I want it to be true only if z is equal to x. OK? Um, does anyone want to suggest a formula for this? A two-variable Boolean formula that should only be true if z is equal to x. This is sort of like assignment for a programming language perspective. Yeah. Uh, and somewhere uh, you went there or here, okay. Not z and not x. That's absolutely true, right? So, um, right. So if z and x are different, then both sides will evaluate to false. If z and x are the same, they'll both one of them will evaluate to true, depending on whether they're both true or both false. I should point out that uh, the approach taken here is sort of one standard way to kind of churn out formulas. And that's almost, it's almost like encoding a truth table in the sense that at some level we're rattling off all the combinations that would evaluate it to true, right? So one and one, would have, we want that to be true and zero, zero, we want to be true. So when I say z and x, the only way to satisfy it is to set z equal to 1 and x equal to 1, right? That's what an and forces us to do. Likewise, for the other side. And an or is saying you could pick one of these hard-coded combinations. Okay, so that's always this kind of brute forcey way to go about coming up with formulas. Not necessarily the slickest way, but it works. Okay. So in some sense, I can start to encode assignment in SAT, right? Maybe I have a, a, a big, messy part of the formula already, and I want to say z is equal to this messy, messy formula. Well, I'll plug in the, the more complicated, maybe it's not x per se, but maybe this expands out to a much more complicated uh, formula, but I can still substitute in and you know, get something, right? Okay. Here's maybe a, a, another fun one. What about conditional statements, right? This is also like the first thing we do with a programming language, if else statements, okay? So now the goal is I want to, yeah, encode if X, then Y, otherwise Z. Okay, so if x is true, I want to return the value of y. If x is false, I want to return the value of z. Okay. This one's trickier, so I have it written down just in case. Does anyone want to give this a shot? Yeah. X and Y or not X and uh, Z. Oh, uh, maybe it wasn't trickier. It made it look easy. Okay. I think this is correct. If, uh, okay. So one way to parse the logic is as follows. X is either zero or one, right? So if X is one, then, okay, if X is equal to one, then this clause is, oh, I didn't mean to do that. This clause is eliminated right off, 
because that had a bar x at the beginning. This clause survives. And then the and makes you just return whatever y is. If y was 1, it'll return 1. If y was 0, it'll return 0. Right? Is that what you had in mind? And uh, if x is equal to 0, the same thing is going on. x is acting as a switch. If x was 0, that will kill off the first clause. The second clause remains and will return the value of z. Okay? All right, so you can already do assignment. You can already do if else. I'm sure with some imagination, you can start recovering a lot of stuff from program M. Maybe it's not very interesting, but the point is you can do it. Okay. All right, so much for that. So what is the, what is the computational problem that we're interested in? It's called Boolean satisfiability. It's a pretty simple problem. The input is a Boolean formula. Assume it's, you know, syntactically correct and stuff like that. So I give you a Boolean formula, and let's say that it has n variables, and like the total size is m, like if I counted up all the symbols, including parentheses and stuff like that. That's roughly the number of variables plus the number of and and or operators, maybe up to a factor of two. Okay. And the goal is to decide if I can find some way to set the variables to be true or false so that the Boolean formula on a whole comes out to be true or false. Okay. So in that case, we say the formula is satisfiable. Okay. If there is a set of variables, that can make it come out to be true. Okay. And you're just given the formula. You're not told what it's supposed to be or something like that. Okay. Um, so I, I can at least suggest that it's a very clean problem, simple problem, right? Like the, the pieces at play, and, or, not, some parentheses. This is not a wildly complicated problem in terms of its components. Okay. Parsing a formula is not very hard. Building that tree is not very hard. Okay. All right, so let me give you guys uh, an example, obviously a short example. If I gave you this formula and then I ask you, does there exist a satisfying assignment? Can you guys find one? I see, I see some head movement. Okay. Who thinks yes? Great. Who thinks no? Who hates this already? Okay. All right, but why no? Yeah. Yeah, I listed every combination of x1 and x2 in terms of, of yes or no. So whatever you said, it's going to screw up one of them. Okay. It's sort of the only <laughs> compact way I could think of one that's obviously false. Okay, but that's what the problem would look like. And even in the simplest example I could think of, I'm sure it took more than half a second to realize the pattern. Okay. So now imagine trying to do this with n variables. Maybe it would be a lot more complicated. Okay. So that's, that's the problem. The problem makes sense? Okay. What's next? Oh, okay. Okay. Now, one one thing about this problem. Uh, on one hand, it seems uh, different than what we talked about last class, searching and sorting. 
but we can still think of it as a search problem in the following more general sense. If you have the right answer, if you have a satisfying assignment, then you can double check that it's correct very quickly, right? So if the answer is yes, right, and you find it, you can also verify that you found the right thing. Why? Because the satisfying assignment we can plug in and it's not very hard to evaluate a Boolean formula. Build out the tree, work your way up. Or you can do it in linear time, probably using just a stack. Okay. But this is a, a, a very interesting feature that we can at least recognize and give proof, a compact, easy to verify proof when the answer to the question is yes. We don't have a compact proof if the answer is no. It's very hard for me to explain to you that no combination would work. But if I'm just trying to convince you that one combination works, then I just have to give you the combination. So any problem like this is called a search problem. Okay. At a high level, that's very similar to the over-under game. Okay. So that means that we have at least one not very clever algorithm at our disposal, which is that we can always brute force. I can guess all combinations and for each verify the answer. Okay. Not all problems are like this, but this one is. Okay. So at least brute force is at our disposal, that's a start. And so the next question then is, uh, of course, can we do better? Okay, can we do better? And it does seem a little bit harder than the over-under game. Okay. So that brings us to the big question, today's lecture. Is there a polynomial time algorithm for solving Boolean formulas? Okay. We have an exponential time algorithm, it's not particularly interesting. Okay. So here I'm quite happy to open the floor. Does anyone have any ideas to try to method, method a lot, whatever. Uh, go about this problem in an organized fashion and try to do better than brute force. No wrong answers, just for fun? Yeah. Find some pairs? Okay, so what do what does pairs mean? Okay. Uh, okay, so let me just try to write down. Uh, X1... Uh, okay, so like you find something like this, uh, uh, but it's part of, you know, a whole lot of other stuff. Okay, uh, sorry, you said not X2. Uh-huh, okay, so we can look for, uh, you know, this kind of symmetrical pattern thing. So I guess that tells me as far as these guys are concerned, Okay, so what would this tell me? What do I do now? Yeah, okay. Uh, well, so, so say this pattern. Can we gleam? Uh, does this force X1 and X2 to be something in particular?
If we want the whole thing to be satisfied at the end, yeah. Okay, so to satisfy these two, because this is actually the exclusive or from before, it's slightly different form, I think. So I think this implies that x1 cannot be equal to x2 if I want to satisfy both of those. Okay, so, so there is this idea that we can try to nibble off some stuff. Any other, any other suggestions? There seems to be many possibilities. Well, I can give one that, that sometimes students suggest is like, let's say that I'm looking at some variable x1, right? And I want to decide, ah, should it be true or false? And then, I don't know, I can see how many times does it appear uh, just by itself in the positive, where a positive would kind of help, true would help and how many times it appears negated, or maybe false would help or something. And maybe guess accordingly if it's really lopsided. I've heard that suggestion before. It's not unreasonable, at least initially. It's not clear how to prove anything in the worst case. It seems like the tallies can be deceiving. So th this is a problem that um, that everyone is 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 quite interested in solving. You know, applications from operations research to chip design to anything else. Roughly, if you can encode your problem logically, you would like to find the answer. Right. But we we don't have an algorithm, and we don't even know if there should or shouldn't be an algorithm. So this has been an issue for like, since the dawn of computers. This is some of the first problems they were trying to solve because it seems perfect for a computer. Okay. The best answer we have, and we'll explore this more technically, so I'm only paraphrasing, is that A polynomial time algorithm might be too good to be true. If we could solve this in polynomial time, it turns out it could have so much implications, it's almost depressing. Okay, so we're going to explore this idea over the course of the whole semester. And I'll make much more explicit exactly what we mean by too good to be true. And this is also not at all a fully satisfactory answer. If an algorithm came a longer way, we would be very happy. Really our best answer is that everyone's tried for 50 years. Okay, what comes next? Okay. So if, for the time being, Boolean formulas are hard to address in general in the worst case, although you could do heuristics like looking for little patterns that give you some clues, what if we start looking at special cases of the problem? Special cases don't necessarily have to be hard, right? As long as they're not solving all Boolean formulas in general. All right, so I think one, one, one way I think of Boolean formulas getting complicated is when the tree gets very deep. That to me kind of represents complications. So what if I force the tree to be very flat? Okay. So that's called conjunctive normal form, but it means 
that the formula is like one big logical and of a bunch of ors. Okay. So a formula in conjunctive normal form, the tree will kind of look like this every time. I have my conjunction up at the top, and then I have this disjunctions of a few variables at the second level. Okay. This is much cleaner than Boolean formulas in general. A tree is hardly necessary to see kind of what's going on. Okay. Great. So we can have the same question. Maybe we'll call it CNF sat this time, and the last one we'll call Boolean sat. So CNF sat will ask, you know, if I give you a Boolean formula, but it's already in CNF in conjunctive normal form. Is it satisfiable? Okay, it's a special case. We're not trying to solve all the Boolean formulas in the world. We're trying to solve this kind of cleaned up version. Nice and flat. Okay. All right. Who thinks that we can solve this one? Okay, a few brave souls. Who thinks we cannot solve it anyway? A few people. Who's indifferent? Okay, who's a liar? Just kidding. Okay, so is there a polynomial time algorithm for the special case? All right, so when I want to think about this problem, I want to retreat back to something we did earlier. You know, one way to sort of convince ourselves that Boolean formulas have more complexity than initially suggested is to see if we can sort of simulate a programming language using just Boolean operations which of course is sort of implicit in the fact that your programming language is whatever you use run on a computer, nonetheless. Okay. So let's take z equal x. The formula we had before is not in CNF. This is actually called disjunctive normal form because it's kind of opposite. It's a disjunction of conjunction or of ands. But we can turn it into conjunctive normal form, right? So we have all these like uh, associative rules and distributive rules. I'm sure you've seen before. Okay. So step me through this. How, let, let me give you i I'll give the first line and then I'll let you guys take it from there. Okay. So maybe what I'll do is I'll expand out where I take this term and put it alongside each of these, right? So what does that give us? So Z or not Z and not X, and x or not z and not x. You should let me know if I make a mistake, because I often make a mistake. All right, what comes next? Gradually working this way towards conjunctive normal form.
So this is good, right? Here's a conjunction on the outside. That's what we're going for. But I still need to address each of those two halves. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so just, just tell me what to expand. Just tell me what to write. Okay, here's that outer and. And the right side should follow similarly, so what is that? So it's totally mechanical, nothing uh, too creative. We can uh, clean up the notation a little bit. So I sort of have an and of two ands, right? But at some level, that's sort of just like that and and that and that. Just to make it a little prettier, I can get rid of one of these outside parentheses, okay? Anything else I can do to clean it up? Yeah. Uh, second seat, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, we have some freebies. Z and not Z, that's always true. X or not X, that's always true. Okay. So we're left with This sort of symmetric looking thing. I guess it should be symmetric because Z equals X is a symmetric statement. I don't know if I could have guessed this <laughs> if you told me implement X equals Z and C and F and I tried to do it directly. But I guess we did it the lazy way and it was okay. Let's play the same game with conditional statements. If x, then y, else z, we had our lazier disjunctive normal form from before. Okay. What should we do first? Yeah. All right, so just tell me what to write. Here's one parenthesis. Oh, so you're gonna go straight for, uh, sh let me just do it one step at a time because uh, it's our first couple of times. Yeah. yeah, just like last time, <laughs> maybe not so interesting. Uh, okay, and in the next row, then we'd get, go for it if you want. I do something wrong. Uh, okay, now I find myself a little confused. Oh, I'm sorry. So did I flip all the signs in the second row? Okay. 
Yeah, sorry. Okay, it should be an and. All right, one sec. We have a fair number of people here. Is the second row correct? One thumbs up, two thumbs up. Okay, two out of 100 plus is not very inspiring. <laughs> that means I might be wrong. Which one should be an end? After X or Z. Oh, okay. Let me. Well, no, don't worry about the third line yet. I screwed up the second line. Is the second line correct? See if I can get like uh, just two more thumbs up, and I'll feel better. Oh, okay. Nobody wants to be the first thumbs up, but uh, okay. All right, sorry about that. I screwed that up. Um, okay, so the next row you were saying, uh, I guess X or X bar. Uh, and I guess uh, okay. Oh, good. The hands are nice and and lined up now. Okay. Okay, good. That seems more sane. And now, now, any suggestions? Yeah. All right, so this is redundant. Okay, so then we're left with X or Z and Y or not X and Y and Z or Z. Okay, a little confusing. Harder for me to parse. But assuming we did our steps correctly, of which at least eight people think we did, hopefully this is a CNF for if X then Y else Z. Okay. So the takeaway is that it was a little more laborious, and the answers are a little bit more mysterious, at least to me. But CNF is still pretty expressive. Okay. All right. So if I took a vote again, who thinks that we can do a polynomial time algorithm for CNF formulas? Okay, still have some brave souls. Who thinks that we, we, we maybe can't get a polynomial time algorithm for CNF? Few in the back. Okay, same enthusiasm as before. All right. Okay. Okay, so we wanna know uh, if there's a satisfying solution. And here then, what's coming up? Ah, okay, so here's the answer. <laughs> We don't know this one either. Sort of in a similar state as Boolean formulas. Actually, we'll make uh, the exact relationship clear in a moment. Okay, so even, even three sat formulas, which are flat, there's no depth to them. We don't have an algorithm for that either. This is annoying. But here's something we can do to help us understand 3SAT a little bit better. Okay. So clearly, Boolean formulas are more general than 3SAT. 3SAT is a special case of Boolean formulas. So if you can solve Boolean formulas, then of course you can solve 3SAT. Right? That's straightforward. But what about the opposite direction? Suppose I gave you a black box that could solve 3SAT. 
what else could I use that to solve? What would be the implications of pretending that I could solve three stacks? Right? Even if I don't have an algorithm to solve it, I can still imagine having one and trying to understand the consequences as a thought experiment. Maybe we could still learn something about the problem that way. Okay. All right, so here is, um, here's the theorem which conceptually is a lot, so we'll go slowly. And I'm only paraphrasing first and I'll give some details in a moment. It's saying that I can take any Boolean formula and convert it into conjunctive normal form, sort of like we did for those small examples before, but by also roughly preserving the same size. So I can flatten it out, but sort of the total number of nodes in the tree will still be within a constant factor. So I can take a Boolean formula, I can flatten it out, but the key point is that I'm not going to make the formula much bigger and I'm going to preserve satisfiability. Okay? In fact, the, the CNF form, formula will be look a little bit different, but the CNF formula will be true or satisfiable if and only if that Boolean formula was satisfiable. So let me unroll what I mean. Okay. So if you give me a Boolean formula with n variables and say total size m, counting up all the symbols, that's sort of the input size of your problem. Okay. Then, and we'll come up with an algorithm that in polynomial time, will produce another formula, but this time in CNF form, right? It's all flattened out, okay? Now, if you look, you'll see that the number of variables has changed. The new formula may have more variables than before, okay? However, the total number of variables will still be close to the total size of your input. So it'll increase, but by a somewhat limited amount. And the total size of the formula will still be pretty similar. I'll note that, okay, we're gonna be careful and actually the formula is only gonna increase by a constant factor in size, but this theorem would still be interesting if it blew up by a polynomial. But it was a polynomial, not an exponential. That's the key point. Okay. So, okay, good. So, when I go back to my question of can I solve CNF formulas, this, what comment does this construction make on that question? We're asking a question of can we solve CNF? And I gave you some connection between CNF and the previous problem of general Boolean formulas. Yeah. You can't solve CNF, but you can always convert a non-CNF formula to a CNF formula in uh, polynomial time. Yeah, so, okay, so complete this sentence for me. If you can solve CNF formulas in polynomial time, then, Ah, then we can solve Boolean formulas also in polynomial time. I take the Boolean formula, I clean it up in polynomial time, and then I solve that CNF version. Okay. So while we don't have an algorithm for CNF, I have a reduction, as it's called, from Boolean formulas to CNF, the CNF version, which we were hoping would be easier which says that maybe it's not much easier. Okay. So polynomial time algorithm for CNF uh, forms imply a polynomial time algorithm for all Boolean forms, which maybe it's less surprising that we can't solve all Boolean formulas. Okay. 
So this is our first example of something called a reduction. Boolean satisfiability has been reduced, or maybe it's vice versa. Maybe solving sat has been reduced to solving Boolean. I always get it backwards. It's one of the two, yeah. Sure, so this is, a, this is a good question, so let me write it out. The high level question was, why am I even focused on CNF? What about DNF? Okay. So we, we, I briefly mentioned DNF, but let me explain. DNF looks like, if I get it right, uh, X and Y and Z or this, or this, okay? It's an or of ands. You only have to satisfy one of the clauses and the clauses tell you exactly what every variable has to be. So DNF is like always trivial. Okay. okay. So if DNFs are easy to solve, what does that tell us about Boolean formulas? Yeah. Not all Boolean formulas can be directly converted to DNF. Ah, okay. Well, what if all Boolean formulas cannot be converted to DNF? What about that suggestion? Any, any thoughts? Yeah. Certainly formulas already in DNF are in DNF. But what if I told you every formula could be put in DNF? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so first let me explain why everything can be in F. I mentioned it earlier, right? But every formula has a truth table. You know, you list off all the things that are true and all the things that are false, right? And I only have to encode all the trues in a formula. That gives me a DNF, okay? So that's, certainly we have a DNF for any Boolean function. Yeah. Sure, okay, so uh, I only drew three variables in this, but this could have been much bigger. Some of these, you know, sure, one of the clauses could be big. That's the suggestion, right? Okay. Is that an issue? Big clauses? Yeah. Okay, so there must be some issue, right? Some efficiency issue. But let me first just go this particular question. Do large clauses in and of themselves present an issue? Yes, no, yes, no, yes. Yeah, well, okay, it may be very wide and n variables long, but at least it's straightforward because it's just telling me x1 has to be true X2 has to be false and stuff like that. So if it's a full, it's if it's an or, and there's not that many clauses, but the clauses are really big, you'll still be able to satisfy it by just reading off one of them. So it's not the individual clauses themselves being big that are representing the complexity. That means the issue must be that there's a lot of clauses. Okay. So let's take, for example, that, that truth table approach to making a DNF form. Okay, so that means, you know, we have some formula F. Right, whatever, it's some complicated thing. Maybe it's even given to you as a black box. 
Oh, let me just first explain the, yeah. And then we can test, you know, oh, what happens if I set everything to be zero? If it's true, then when I'm making my DNF, we can encode a, a clause that'll be satisfied for the all zero assignment. And I can rattle off everything and get, make sure I do all the true assignments exactly, right? So that's clumsy, but it works. Okay, so, okay, so now you, your question. Sure, okay, so let's, let's consider this algorithm then uh, for solving Boolean formulas. I, I'm given a Boolean formula. I build out a DNF using uh, like a truth table. And then whatever, I just look at the first clause in my DNF, I'm done. That's an algorithm, that'll work. But what's, what's lacking? Yeah. Yeah, so two things are going on. I mean, there's two ways to look at it. One is that this, there's no reason why the formula should be small, because there could be tons of right answers. On the other hand, the algorithm I just described is doing, it's even worse than just brute force. I mean, at some level, you're just rolling through all the possible answers to build out a formula. If you're clever, you shall at least stop when you find the first one not actually doing anything different. Okay. So the real issue with the, the DNF approach is not that formulas can't be turned into DNF, is that they can't be turned into DNF while maintaining the same size. So here I was doing the truth table approach, that's lazy. Maybe we could have done something more clever like a bunch of De Morgan's laws and stuff like that, where we keep doing the associative, you know, removing parentheses and flip things over. That would seem more direct, but that can blow up on you. Okay. So we don't have a way to turn things into DNF while maintaining the same size. Okay, I'm pretty sure there's counterexamples of a small CNF formula that requires a big DNF formula. Maybe parity or something. Yeah. Uh, okay, so at a hot, you know, zooming back, we want polynomial time algorithms in terms of the input side. So we should always keep track of how big is the input. Now, for us, we can write out the formula, and they're just symbols. So one symbol is a parenthesis, that's whatever, a constant number of bits. An and signed, constant number of bits. A variable, a constant number of bits. So just writing it out in full is the size. Okay, I'm not too worried about whether you're using ASCII or Unicode or what. Okay. So I want something polynomial on that because that represents my input from a computer point of view. Okay. All right, so the DNFs are easy, but unfortunately, we don't know how to take a regular formula and turn it into a DNF while keeping things the same size. I mean, even just, even if I gave up a polynomial, if I went from size 1 million to 1 million squared, I could still get a polynomial time algorithm that way. But we, we can't even, you know, even giving up big polynomials. Okay, okay. so let's, uh, Okay, so that, 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 was, that was a good um, digression because it highlights the emphasis on the size of the resulting CNF formula. Really, all that matters is that it's within polynomial size, but we can be clever and do it without really increasing the size at all. Okay, so how do we do this? All right, so I put up a... Uh, Here's the addition drawn as a tree from before. 
So we're kind of work our way through an example. Okay. And just as one convenient pre-processing step, I want to turn this into a binary tree. So it just makes our discussion easier to describe things. Okay. And the only kind of non-binary point is over here. Okay, so let me uh, do that and then, okay, so not so, not so interesting. Of course, you can do this for any formula. It won't increase the size by that much, but does anyone have a simple reason why? I did, of course, make it a little bigger. How come even, uh, imagine like a lot of big clauses, so then the tree looks bigger, but how come it won't get that much bigger? How come it won't uh, square the size of the tree? So as a hint, the number of leaves in the tree doesn't change. Okay. If you have a tree with end nodes, how many total nodes can the tree have? Even a binary, that's the worst case. Two n minus one, it all comes together. All those internal nodes don't add up to more than the number of leaves. Okay. So, so splitting up, uh, you know, high degree nodes and making a binary is not that big a deal. That's the point. Okay, so this is a little bit cleaner. So now this is our input. You're allowed to introduce variables. Keep that in mind. Any ideas for trying to flatten out this tree? Or inspiration, it doesn't have to be a full idea. All right, as a hint, let me bring back this idea of a SAT programming language. Does that suggest anything? So you can do if else statements, you can do assignments. Yeah. Sorry, can you, can you say that again? Oh, okay, so we could try to do a bunch of flattening stuff, like like we did when we're uh, like in these transformations earlier. I mean, can we play a game like this is what you're saying? Uh-huh. Oh, okay, so maybe we could try to do some local changes and gradually try to flatten it out, sort of similar like we did when we're developing if else and stuff like that. Okay, that might work, but I, it's harder for me to see why that's efficient in the sense of keeping the size nice and small, right? Because it starts having, it starts kind of blowing up. I mean, that one's okay, of course, because you're just passing the, the knot through, but other ones, when we're taking the groups and distributing it, then it starts blowing up exponentially if we're not careful. Yeah. Ah, oh, okay. You want to take a tree and turn it into its own variable. Okay, so we can introduce variables. That's the one thing we can do. So let me introduce something like, uh, you were talking about x1 or x2. Suppose I wrote z1 
at some level, I wanted to sort of encode this. I want Z1 to be always equal to the value of that subtree. Okay. We'll work out the, the calculations in a moment. But if we had done that, and you know, I'm just going to kind of append this as a, as a clause at the end, saying Z1 has to be the equal to the and of these two things, then I can pop in Z1. Right. And since there's some redundancy in this case, um, I can make that Z1. Okay. And I'll have another clause on the side that says Z1 has to be equal to X1 and X2. Okay. Any other ideas? Yeah. Oh, okay. There's three instances of Z1. Good. I'm only crossing it out so we can remember what used to be there. As opposed to erasing it. Yeah. Uh, but this, okay, so the suggestion is... Uh, this one? Or the very top one, start trying to flatten out doing distributive stuff. But again, these local changes is gonna start blowing up the size when you start putting the parentheses in. That maybe works a little bit one at a time, like when we're just doing if else. But if you roll that all the way through a big formula, now things are really adding up. Okay, so, but, but the, the, something more similar to what we just did. Yeah. Okay, not Z1 shows up. Let's, uh, yes, yes, but that's, that's still like more, that's more concrete than what I'm looking at. Okay. Um, okay, that will give you one local improvement, but then there'll be another one. So, mm, oh, okay, give me an alternative. That's a reasonable suggestion, but I'm sort of looking for a slightly more systematic yeah. Too complicated. The suggestion was somehow to do something with X1 and X2 and balance it out. Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, that's how I actually came up with it. So it probably is an if else. However, that's still too, that's still, I mean, yes, true, but very, that's very specific to this formula, right? I mean, we're still looking for patterns. I want to do something. You guys are being too clever. I'm trying to come up with a general algorithm. The Z1 was a really good idea. Yeah. Yeah, so why, why stop at Z1? It is true that Z1 was convenient because it appeared three times, but actually the fact that it appeared three times is besides the point. Okay. Why not make Z2 equal to this subtree? Okay. So I'll kind of write that down as a clause at the end. One of the clauses we have to satisfy. So now Z2 will have to be equal to Z1 and X4. Z1 we've already defined. And now what's left is something that looks like this. Okay. We're making some progress though. That tree's getting smaller and smaller. And I'm just appending extra clauses I need to satisfy. Okay. Any ideas for a third step? Okay. 
trying to get someone in the back. There's many good solutions here. Okay, yeah. Yeah, okay, well, we'll just keep going, right? V3 is equal to uh, something like this. Okay. Drop that down here. Okay. So we can just keep nibbling off subtrees and introducing variables. Okay. And then say we still have to satisfy everything at the end. So these clauses for the equality will be connected by an and. When we, we have a, we'll have a formula that says Z2 has to be equal to Z1 and X4, and it'll be a bunch of ands around it. Okay. So I have to be a little bit briefer because I think we're running out of time. Okay. So we could have worked out uh, what X1 is equal to X2 and X3 by just plugging in, right? So if I plug into our formula here, we'll get X1 or Okay, and x, oh, sorry, x2 and x3, or not x1. Right, I'm just substituting in, and then we'll unroll that into a C and F. It'll be constant size. And you can do the same thing if I want to set x1 is equal to x2 or x3. I guess for us, we always had z's over here. Okay, so each of these assignments will unroll into, you know, a conjunction of five clauses, four clauses. Maybe less if there's some redundancy. Okay. So the overall construction then, if I look at our example, we'll end up introducing variables for every internal node of the tree. Okay. And I'm gonna encode all of these assignments in various clauses. And if you blow that up, you write it all down, you'll get something like this. So if I remember correctly, obviously I did this once and forgot everything. I think this row, corresponds to setting x14 equal to x1 and x2. Okay. And probably this row corresponds to setting x15 to x3 or x4. Okay. And have to satisfy all of them. The ands in between everything. Okay. So we're really, we're kind of encoding, working up the tree. All right, so you, you know you would do that. You throw it into a loop. You take care of details, but it's a systematic approach to taking your Boolean formula and putting it into CNF. It's long, but it's flat. Okay, so I think there should be ands here connecting the rows. Okay, how come the size? This is the last question. How come the size of the formula, although it looks big? is still somewhat proportional to the original input size? Every node in the internal tree mapped to one, uh, every node in the, in the tree mapped to one row in that formula, that row is whatever, eight symbols, 12 symbols. It's constant size, it's a mess, but it's constant size. So the overall size is within a constant. So let me only mention what we didn't cover, and I'll probably try to encode this into some later stuff, okay? Okay, one is three sat, that's conjunctive normal form that only has three variables in every clause. That might be easier, but maybe at this point it won't surprise you to find out three sat is also hard, okay? And probably based on the tricks we just discussed, you can figure out how to take a regular CNF and turn it into a three sat. 
playing similar games. Okay. So now we've actually shown that Boolean formulas are equal to three sat, which we thought would be much simpler. I only mentioned that you could be more general than Boolean formulas and do circuits, which I'm assuming you've seen before. If Boolean formulas were like trees, then circuits, they're, well, they're like directed acyclic graphs. There's no cycles. Okay. So later, I think when we talk about graphs more, I'll reintroduce circuits, how to work with them. But otherwise, there are going to be an intro to graphs, so maybe take a look.